What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. So apparently... Joe Biden has just noticed how bad of a job he's doing as rumors are swirling around the White House that old Joe is getting extremely frustrated with his poll numbers as if it's everyone else's fault. He's doing a crappy job for America. So we're going to look into what's being said by the staffers inside the White House, being how we are just months away from the biggest election in our lifetimes. I don't usually buy into the D.C. high school drama inside the most dirty, most disgusting, dysfunctional city on the face of the planet. But sometimes the small stories tell a much bigger story. And by the end of the show, you'll see what that bigger story is. Also, I have some audio I want to discuss of an old video of Trump when he was negotiating with Pelosi and Schumer in the White House. And in hindsight, it's actually pretty crazy just how right he was and just how wrong they were. So we have a lot to get into. If you want to support the show, you can follow the show on any podcast platform. And most of all, follow the show on Rumble. That helps out the most. It is our last bastion for free speech, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to reach out to me directly, you can reach me at Show at gmail.com. And most of all, what helps out is just sharing the show with your friends and family. Just hit the share button, hit the like button, and subscribe on my YouTube channel subscribe on my rumble channel that helps out the most so i've been getting a lot of messages from all of you about youtube doing some funny business with my channel i don't know exactly what it is i think we can pretty much all guess um so the best way to get the show out there is just the old-fashioned way just by liking and sharing and and following the show that really helps out the show a lot it helps get the content out there and beat the algorithm So without further ado, we got a lot to get into, ladies and gentlemen. As always, thank you for tuning in, and let's do this. You're listening to The Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And now, here's Stephen. All right, so there was actually a an, there was actually a pretty good story. Just real quick, I want to get into it before we start into with the uh, the politics stuff. I wanted to touch base on this science story that I seen. So I have this article. It's actually pretty interesting. So this is from StudyFinds.org, Heart Health News. This came out February twenty fifth of this year, and the title of it is "Bigger Abs Linked to Heart Disease in Men." <laughs> Oh, God. So there you go, folks. If you're like me, you got a few extra pounds you're carrying around. You don't have a six pack washboard abs, then um, you can actually feel pretty good about it. You may just be in better shape than somebody with abs. That's what this article is saying, apparently. So big abs could spell bad news for a man's health. Body composition, which is typically defined as the amount of fat, bone, and muscle in the body, is a concept frequently used by health professionals in relation to heart health. However, researchers from the University of California, San Diego, are challenging this, suggesting that more muscle doesn't automatically mean a lower risk of heart problems. Brietta Larson, the PhD, explains that men with larger abdominal muscle area have a greater risk of heart disease. As far as muscle density goes, the prognosis is much different. Men with the densest muscle within the abdominal cavity had nearly one quarter of the risk of heart disease later in life. Quote, and the other really important thing to note is that we didn't find this with women. It was just in men, said Dr. Larson. The study's lead author and associate professor in the UC San Diego Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science, my God, that was a mouthful, in a, in a media release said the data comes from computed Tomography of participants in the National Institutes of Health multi-ethnic study of, oh my God, I can't even pronounce some of this stuff, man. The team found that the large muscle groups, heart disease risk was nearly six times higher than the group of men with the smallest abdominal muscle area. The team wasn't expecting to see such a strong correlation between increased muscle area and coronary heart disease. So there you go. For all my, uh, for all my fellow... For all my fellow fatties out there <laughs> that are carrying on a few uh, that are carrying a few extra pounds, now you don't have to feel so bad. So there you go. 
maybe well uh, maybe there is some hope for us after all <laughs> so um i've never had abs like i've never in my entire life have i have i had abs you know i was pretty fit when i was younger i wouldn't say i was you know i i always kind of struggled with my weight my weight fluctuated a lot as i was growing up um i just had a really slow metabolism and no matter what i mean but there were a few times in my life to where i was pretty cut and fit but i never had abs so i don't know maybe that's a good thing maybe it's a bad thing it's certainly uh the science is certainly starting to point that direction all right, so to get into the latest news and culture and politics. So what is going on with Joe Biden? It seems as if Joe Biden is starting to freak out on his staffers inside the White House because he sucks at running the country. So here is an article from NBC News. This, this just came out yesterday. Hat tip to Peter Nichols. And it's titled, Behind the Scenes, Biden Has Grown Angry and Anxious About Re-Election Effort. Huh. Biden locked up the Democratic nomination last week, but looking ahead to the general election, anxiety has seemed to increase. Well, duh. I mean, have you looked around? This is what I mean. This is why it's so bad for our leaders to be so detached from regular America. I think that's what made Trump so unique was he was in the construction business. So you actually had a multi-billionaire that could relate to the everyday working man, which is, listen, that's, that's extremely rare. A lot of these guys, a lot of these people, these multi-billionaires, they live completely different lifestyles than we do. But for some reason, Donald Trump managed to stay connected to the working middle class America, which is probably what makes him so likable by <laughs> millions of people. I mean, people voted for Donald Trump 130 million times. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, folks. You think about it, he got, what, 64 one election, then he got 75 the next election. You know, give some, you know, give or take. You know, you're looking at 130 million times people voted for him. It's pretty insane. Um, which is more than I can say for Joe Biden. This guy is a human pandemic. This guy's a walking disaster, and what pisses me off the most is everybody warned that Joe Biden was going to be a bad president. And what sucks is, you know, weeks and months going into the election, we tried warning everybody. I know I certainly did. I was like, look, Joe Biden is not worth the destruction of our country. Like, And, and I remember, I so wish I can go back and find the message that I wrote. I actually tried the other day, but maybe I just didn't look hard enough. But I want to find it because in that message that I wrote, it was like in October of 2020. And I remember saying exactly what was going to happen. And almost everything that I said was going to happen in this warning message I sent out all over Facebook has happened. And and it's not by coincidence. It's just that I knew who Joe Biden was and I knew who he wasn't. And I knew how the media was trying to portray him. I knew about his family's corruption a long, long time ago. The Bidens have always been under the microscope when it comes to corruption. And people have been bailing this family out for decades um, as far as corruption goes. So I already knew Joe Biden was going to be a disaster. And it just sucks that people didn't listen, man. And, and everybody had to learn the lesson the hard way. I, I mean, it, it, it's just unfortunate. So anyways, to get back into this article. Uh, It says President Joe Biden was seething in a private meeting at the White House in January. Allies of the president had just told him that his poll numbers in Michigan and Georgia had dropped over his handling of the war between Israel and Hamas. Yeah, that's not a big shocker. Um, Has anybody like do, do these people realize how many people have died at the hands of Joe Biden? I mean, not by Joe Biden directly, but Joe Biden has a lot of blood on his hands. I mean, what was it? The first, what, two months in office, you had the Afghanistan withdrawal debacle. We did a show on that. That was a disaster that is going to have ripple effects throughout the next two, three generations. I mean, he essentially armed Iran. He armed Al Qaeda, all these Middle Eastern All these Middle Eastern terrorist groups all have our military equipment. 
And we actually went through that very, very long list of the guns, the tanks, the choppers, the 50 cows, the night vision goggles, the um, the metro, the biometrics data, like all this stuff, enough to supply an entire army was left over there in Afghanistan and all because of Joe Biden. And so you have one thing after another after another. And let's just pray to God China doesn't invade Taiwan. I think they're waiting after the election, but that is a theory of mine that we'll get into maybe on the next segment. But it's not a surprise that people don't like death, war, and destruction. And so when Joe Biden brings death and destruction, you can kind of almost count on people not exactly rooting for your side. <laughs> um, so it says Michigan and Georgia, both are battleground states. He narrowly won four years ago, and he can't afford any backsliding if he is to once again defeat Donald Trump. He began to shout and swear. A lawmaker familiar with the meeting said, whoa, he believed that he had been doing what was right, despite the political fallout, he told the group, according to the lawmaker. I mean, come on. Does this guy really think what th this is what I'm talking about? This is why it's so bad to have somebody that has the 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 cognitive ability of a grapefruit running our country. Did he honestly think that what he was doing was right with the Afghanistan withdrawal? The guy checked his watch as they were rolling the coffins of those 13 soldiers off of the plane. Did he think that was right? I mean, that was a disaster. He doesn't even mention their names. And that is just at the very beginning of his administration. That's not even going into all the other stuff that has happened since then. The war in Russia and Ukraine. And you can't say that this would have happened under Donald Trump because I am, I'm almost certain 100% certain I would bet my paycheck the war in Ukraine would not be going on. Russia would not have invaded Ukraine if Donald Trump was in office. And you might say, yeah, but how do you know that? Well, we know that because Joe Biden, you guys remember that speech? You guys remember that press interview he did where he came out and said, oh, you know, it's one thing if it's like a, a major invasion. It's another thing if it's just like, a, you know, a little, well, you know what? I think I have. I think I have the audio here. Yeah, let's just go ahead and let's go ahead and find the audio. Here, this is how I know that it's because of Joe Biden's incompetency that Russia invaded Ukraine. Here, check this out. Russia will be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion, and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, et cetera. But if they actually do what they're capable of doing with the force amassed on the border, it is going to be a disaster for Russia. You said that Russia would be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. Are you saying that a minor incursion by Russia into Ukrainian territory would not lead to the sanctions that you have threatened, or are you effectively giving Putin permission to make a small incursion into the country? <laughs> Good question. Um, so it did sound like, didn't it? So there you go. So that was essentially Joe Biden greenlighting the invasion in Ukraine. So it's no wonder. So, so did this guy really think that what he was doing was the right thing to do? I mean, it's just one mistake after another after another. And the reason why you got and you guys remember Robert Gates, right? Robert Gates, the former Obama uh, Secretary of Defense, when he said that Joe Biden has been wrong on every foreign policy the last forty years. So, I mean, what did people think was going to happen, really? Joe Biden, I knew Joe Biden was going to be a disaster. Everybody did. But unfortunately, these people hated Donald Trump more than they loved their country. And so we got stuck with Joe Biden. If you think he was legitimately elected, which I don't happen to think he was legitimately elected, I think that election was riddled with irregularities, shenanigans, and just in some cases, just straight up fraud. Changing the laws weeks and months before the election by Mark Elias. The guy is a, a walking, he is a human wrecking ball. And people are starting to see it because, you know, the, the news and the media and his staffers and his campaign manager, they can come out and say all they want. They could say the economy's doing great. You know, they, they can try and evade the fact that we're in, in foreign conflicts all over the globe now. 
but people see this stuff with their own eyes. And I think the Biden administration, the campaign would be better off just being up front with people. They're so worried about optics and what everything looks like. They think it's like back in the 1950s where they can just hide stuff from the American people, like as if Internet didn't it doesn't exist. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really do believe Joe Biden lives in a reality where Internet doesn't exist. This guy will lie over and over and over again. And it's the same lie that he's been caught in a, a dozen times. And he just continues to, to repeat the lie. The guy lies about lying. I mean, the guy is a pathological liar. And, he, you know, he always brings up his kid that died from cancer. Every time somebody loses a, a, a child in war or, or in Afghanistan in that, in that withdrawal, he would tell the family, oh, I know, I, I know how you feel about losing a loved one overseas. It's like, what, dude? Like, your kid died from cancer like six years after he left the service. So it's like, no, it's not even close. He tried telling these parents that their, their kid got blown up in Afghanistan. Oh, I can relate to you. What? This guy is bonafiably insane. <laughs> and so to get back to this article, <clears throat> so he believed he was doing what was right, despite the political fallout. He told the group, according to the lawmaker, asked about the episode, Andrew Bates, a White House spokesman, said, quote, President Biden makes national security decisions based on the country's national security needs alone. No other factor. Really? If that's the case, then don't you think our open southern border is a national security threat? I would say that's pretty big. So that right there is a lie. People, like, this is what I'm saying. It, some of the stuff, they think the American people are dumb. <laughs> like, you, this guy's sitting here saying that Joe Biden makes decisions based on the country's national security needs alone. But yet you have a completely open southern border that's flooding this country in, that's flooding this country with millions upon millions of illegal immigrants that we don't even know who they are or where they're from. So it doesn't make sense. And people can see this. The people connect the dots here. It's like, well, that can't be true because he has an open southern border. If Joe Biden was truly concerned about our nation's security, he would seal up that southern border, knowing that there's terrorist threats coming in through the southern border. We know this for a fact, okay? It's, it is a fact now that terrorists, okay, people on the terror watch list, people that want to hurt this country are being let in, are coming in through the southern border. This is a fact. Chris Ray at the FBI has said this over and over again, just as like a CYA. Like, oh yes, we are starting to see some heavy terrorist activity at the southern border. And he's only saying that because he wants to cover his own ass. He wants to do the old CYA so that if something happens, he can be like, hey, I told you, I told you so. And so Joe Biden is not making decisions based off the nation's security. No. All right. So for months, Democrats have watched the 2024 campaign unfold with rising alarm as the sitting president struggles to gain ground against his defeated predecessor. Frustrations rippling through the party have reached the top with Biden at times second guessing travel decisions and communication strategies that have left much of the electorate clueless about his record. Interviews with nearly 20 lawmakers, present and past administration officials and Biden allies show. The starting gun for the general election campaign fired last week as Biden wrapped up the Democratic nomination. Yet he is still searching for ways to impress upon voters that he deserves a second term by by dint of policy achievements and eluded past presidents. What? This guy thinks people are going to vote for his policy decisions? Jeez, man. This is... <sighs> so history suggests it will be... <laughs> Listen to this. Mind you, this is NBC, by the way. This is pretty left. It's about as left as you can get. It says history suggests it will be tough for him to recover. Biden's 38% approval rating at this stage in the calendar year is lower than that of the last three presidents who went on to lose re-election. Trump at 48%, George H.W. Bush 39%, and Jimmy Carter 43%, according to Gallup survey data. Biden has long believed that he isn't getting sufficient credit for an economy that has created 15 million new jobs. This is what I'm talking about. He is detached from America. 
either his people are not giving him the truth and they're lying to him and then talking crap about him behind his back, or this guy is completely full blown in dementia and has to be shot up with Adderall to get to to move around. I mean, the the differences between Joe Biden when you see him and he's going to like some random event or he's sitting at, you know, listening to a speech, the guy looks like a nursing home patient. But then you see him at the State of the Union and he looks like he was he was high on some he was high on something, folks. I really want to know what they pumped him with for the State of the Union, because Biden was alert. It's almost and it's not because I don't think he practiced it. It's not like he rehearsed the speech. I think he was genuinely I think he was genuinely on drugs. I do. I don't know which ones he's on. I don't know which ones they're pumping him with. Probably like some some like experimental drug that <laughs> that they give presidents uh that they that they have hidden away somewhere that that who knows, man. But the guy is clearly not all there until they pump him up with whatever it is they're pumping him up with. But, I mean, he really thinks he's not getting credit for the economy. The American people are going to give him the credit for the economy that he's owed, which is none. This man ruined this economy. The, the American people are watching home ownership just vanish. Anybody under 35, forget about it. You will own nothing and be happy. Interest rates, credit cards. We're going to get into that in a second because the economy is a disaster. And people can see it with their own eyes. And, and he's so desperate to win Michigan. I mean, he has to placate to the Hamas supporters in, in Dearborn, Michigan. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know that Dearborn, Michigan is one of the highest populated Muslim communities, Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim counties in America is Dearborn. And so Joe Biden is trying to be the, the chameleon that he is, the expert politician. He's trying to play both sides. He doesn't want to lose the Jewish vote. And so during, you know, speeches, he'll sit there and say, oh, yes, we're sending Israel aid. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, he's actually undermining Netanyahu, which we'll get into in a second. And then he'll go to Dearborn, Michigan. He'll fly over to Michigan and he'll tell the Muslims how bad he feels for the Palestinians over there and how they're they're curtailing the IDF, the Israeli army from winning the war. Folks, this administration is purposely undermining the Israeli military. They're running out of bombs and ammunition now because they're not sending what they need over there. All these people want to do is defeat the people that, have, that are trying to kill them and killed and slaughtered 1,200 Jews. Like, so it's like, it, it's so mind blowing to me, especially with that speech that Chuck Schumer gave the other day that Joe Biden apparently helped him with. It's so shocking to me that we have this administration, America, is undermining Israel, is preventing Israel from beating their enemy that just slaughtered 1,200 of their people. That is like after 9-11, the EU calls over to our president, President Bush at the time, and saying, hey, hey, look, look, you know, it wasn't that bad. Maybe you shouldn't go over there and, you know, get revenge. Maybe, maybe it's time for you just kind of to settle down. Like, this is what we're dealing with. This is what this administration is doing. They're undermining Israel's ability to defeat Hamas, a terrorist group that slaughtered 1,200 of their people. I mean, do you think America would allow that? <laughs> and then you have Chuck Schumer going out there on national TV talking about how the people need to elect somebody other than Bibi Netanyahu. The, and these people claim to be the defenders of democracy. Israel is one of the only democratic countries in the Middle East. I think it is the only democratic country in the Middle East. It is our ally, our, our number one ally, Israel, where the, 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 the heart and soul of Christianity and Catholicism you know, the, the religion this country was founded on. That's all of our history over there. The Judeo-Christian history over there in Israel, the Catholicism, like all this stuff all came from Israel. So Israel is our biggest ally. And Joe Biden and the Biden administration are going to undermine it 
so that these countries like Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah destroy them? This, the two-state solution is not going to work, folks. All it's going to do, it's going to give a permanent residence for Hamas to, to just pick off Jews one by one, and you'll see events like October 7th happening over and over and over again. It'll give Hamas legitimacy. It'll give them a country is essentially what they're doing. What they're asking Israel to do is forfeit a huge portion of their country and give it to Palestinians and Hamas and all the all the uh, and all the terrorist groups that lie within it. And so all you're going to have is October 7th over and over and over again, probably every year. No, man, no. Israel needs to wipe Hamas off the map. Get rid of them. And they are on the brink of doing it, too. They're, they, are, they are a couple weeks away. They got them cornered in one little city, one little section of, of Gaza. And this administration is undermining them and, and threatening them that if you go through with wiping the rest of these Hamas leaders out, we are not going to support you. What? It's nuts what's going on. And this is what Biden tells Dearborn, Michigan. This is what Joe Biden tells the Palestinians in Dearborn, Michigan, and he's trying to play both sides. But I guarantee you, the Jewish people can see right through this stuff, man, right through it. So here is an article from Fox News. This just came out about nine hours ago. It says Benjamin Netanyahu blasts Chuck Schumer and Biden over the waning support for Israel. Quote, focus should be bringing down Hamas. I agree. And so it says Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a sharp rebuttal against Senator Chuck Schumer, who called for new leadership in the Jewish state. Quote, I think Schumer's statements are wholly inappropriate. I think we're not a banana republic. <laughs> the people of Israel will choose when, they'll, when they have elections. And it's not something that will be foisted upon us, Netanyahu said on Fox and Friends on Sunday. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, called on Israel to elect a new prime minister to replace Benjamin Netanyahu in order to move towards a lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians in the form of a two-state solution. This two-state solution is not going to work. And I don't know why people insist on believing these people know what they're doing. They have been wrong on almost every single issue for the last six decades, all right, since World War II, when we dropped the bomb. Everything after that has been wrong, all right? So why are people getting advice from people like Chuck Schumer? And most of all, why are people getting military advice from Joe Biden? Like, if, if, I, if I would not take military advice from Joe Biden if he was the last person on earth to talk to. And yet Joe Biden works with Chuck Schumer to release this letter telling the Israeli people that they should hold elections and get rid of Bibi Netanyahu, that Netanyahu is the problem. Oh, why? Because Netanyahu and Trump like each other. This is how broken these people are. They are so afraid of Donald Trump that anybody in his orbit must be destroyed. This is how psychologically and emotionally broken people have become from Trump derangement syndrome, which is a real mental disorder which we discussed in, in yesterday's episode. So here is an interview on Fox News of Bibi Netanyahu and his response to that letter from Chuck Schumer here. Check this out. Right now in Qatar, a country playing a lot of double games these days, ceasefire negotiations set to resume between Israel and Hamas as Israel still fights to defend itself from the brutal military attack on their country. When more than 1,200 Israelis were murdered, and still, Hamas holds more than 100 hostage. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu joins us live from Jerusalem with an update. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, the cease calls for a ceasefire at this point are extortion. Uh, the other uh, on, on behalf of Hamas. But you've, you're, you've been in the press talking a lot about the offensive in Rafah. How does that play into getting Hamas to a place where they're prepared to negotiate on your terms? Look, the only thing that gets Hamas to uh, release the hostages is continued military pressure. That's what enabled us to bring out already half of the hostages. That's what will enable us to get the remaining hostages. At the same time, there has to be pressure, pressure from Qatar that has, wields enormous influence on, uh, mm -hmm. on Hamas, and they should be pressed to press them. So uh, the, the fact that we're 
uh, going to destroy the remaining Hamas terrorist battalions in Rafah uh, does is is both important for uh, eradicating the Hamas rule, but also important for getting the hostages out. Uh, these are complementary goals; they're not contradictory goals. How many Hamas fighters, terrorists remain in Rafah? What kind of force are we talking about? Uh, we've Pete, we've destroyed about. Uh, uh, 19 of uh, Hamas 24 terrorist battalions. So there are about four in uh, Rafah. We have to destroy them. When people tell us, don't go into Rafah, that's like telling the allies, uh, listen, don't go into Berlin, <laughs> leave, leave a quarter of the Nazi army intact. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, if we leave a quarter of the uh, Hamas uh, uh, fighting uh, uh, terrorist f- uh, battalions in place, they'll regroup, reconquer Gaza. And uh, in fact, perpetrate once again what they vow to do, which is to repeat the October 7th massacre over and over and over again. That's not- Boom. That's exactly what I said. And everybody can see this. A two-state solution is, will be a, a death nail for Israel. I mean, and it's, it's so insane that this administration continues to fund Iran, giving Iran the capacity to fund Hamas giving Hamas the capacity to continue on this war and to continue on attacking Israel. We talked about this in one of our shows. It's a will versus capacity issue. You know, just because a terrorist may have the will, they can't do anything if they do not have the capacity to carry out those those acts of terrorism. And what Joe Biden and this administration do is it gives these terrorist organizations the capacity to carry out acts of terrorism. And so this was something Donald Trump was very good at. He removed their capacity to carry out acts of terrorism. So they can have all the will they wanted. They can jump up and down talking about how they're going to destroy Israel and and destroy America. But how are they going to do it when they don't have guns, when they don't have bullets, when they don't have money? And that's exactly what Donald Trump did. That was his policy towards these these insane, chaotic Middle Eastern terrorist groups is he had his foot on their throats, choking out their capacity. And so Netanyahu is exactly right. Why would we allow, and, and this goes much deeper, I think, than what people see on the surface. I don't think they want this Hamas terrorist group to be eradicated. These people, you have to understand, places like Boeing and Lockheed, the military industrial complex is thrives off of war, death, destruction. When there's no war, there's no guns firing. When there's no guns firing or missiles going off, that means these people aren't selling guns and missiles, which means they can't keep the lights on. The only way they can keep the lights on is if they're selling guns and bullets. That's it. And so for this administration to tell Netanyahu, really, to ta- for Netanyahu to take any advice from this administration when militarily, is insane. But for this administration to tell Netanyahu, oh yeah, just leave a quarter of the Hamas terrorists that just slaughtered 1,200 of your people. Why? So they can come back, regroup, and do it again? This is what I'm saying. This is why a two-state solution is not going to work. And by Joe Biden continuously funding these people is going to do nothing but continue the death and destruction. Just let Israel wipe these Hamas terrorists off the map and be done with it. Right. No two state solution. That's what I'm saying. It's all ridiculous, but it's ridiculous on purpose. They don't want anybody winning this war. They don't want Israel winning. And Iran is on the brink of getting nuclear weapons. Can you imagine if the if if these terrorist groups get nuclear weapons? I mean, my God, man, that should be like that should be top priority for this administration. And what does this administration do? gives them more money, gives them more capacity. It's just, it's so wrong on every single level. And for Chuck Schumer to come out there on national TV with this stupid speech that him and Joe Biden wrote, talking about how the people of Israel need to vote out Netanyahu. Like, dude, these people are so totalitarian Marxists. They are such totalitarians. Like, they think they can tell another democratic country how to run their elections, when and who to vote for. I mean, it's just crazy, man. And so this is the problem Joe Biden's having, and this is why he's getting frustrated, because everything that they touch turns to crap. 
And Joe Biden wonders why his his approval ratings at 38 percent. There's nothing this guy can do to increase his numbers. I don't know what he could do, honestly, unless he did a complete 180, unless he just came out and said, listen, we're going to secure the border. We're going to start deporting unless he did everything Donald Trump did. This guy is his numbers are not going to improve. And this is what drives me even more nuts. This is what drives me nuts the most is that Joe Biden would have been an actual he would have been a pretty successful president if he just would have left things alone. <laughs> this is what's crazy. Like this guy could have came in and did absolutely nothing and would have been probably skipping his way into a second term. But now he's got a battle. And if he wins, it's going to be a disaster for this country. Could you imagine another four years of this? I mean, it, it, this, I don't know if we can handle another four years. And that is a common, that's a common phrase I hear from a lot of people. It's like, my God, I hope Donald Trump wins because we can't handle another four years of this. That is like the, <laughs> that is like the number one sentence that I hear from my fellow Americans when I'm talking to them is that this situation is unsustainable. They may not know exactly what it is, but all they know is that this is unsustainable for their families, for their homes, for their finances, for their health, for their safety and security. Like, I mean, just go down the list. We are entering the stages of third world territory here. And these people are trying to throw Joe Biden's opponent off the ballot, trying to throw him in prison. Like we're living in, in freaking Venezuela. <laughs> like we're in like some third world banana republic. Oh, Joe Biden can't win on his own. So let's just uh, jail his opponent. What? These people are nuts, man. Totally nuts. And what's crazy is that the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party supports it. That's what's crazy is they support every bit of this weaponization of the justice system. They come right out and say it. Oh, we must get Donald Trump convicted before the election. It's like, whoa, man. They are reaching like level 11 of disparity here. I think, you know, in the biggest, the part that worries me the most is not just, you know, what's happening, all the dangers in the Middle East, but what about our southern borders? Like this turned out to be, and just like everybody on the right said it would be, this turned out to be the biggest disaster of Joe Biden's presidency was the southern border. And we said this in 2021, the moment that Joe Biden was elected, I said it. I said they are going to open up the southern borders and flood this country with illegal immigrants, and they're going to lie to everybody's faces while they're doing it. And that's exactly what they're doing. You got the Mayorkas the Secretary of Homeland Security, laughing, laughing at a congressional hearing when he's being questioned about the security of the southern border, smiling, laughing in people's faces, telling them that the, that the border is secure. The Vice President Kamala Harris, the border is secure. Like what? I mean, you watch, you're watching two separate channels here. There's two different realities at the same time. It's like they're telling you one thing but you're looking at another thing with your own eyes. So check this out. This is from the New York Times. Chicago begins evicting migrants from shelters, citing strain on resources. Well, duh. I mean, this is exactly the type of stuff that the people on the right say what's wrong with just having open borders is it puts a strain on the system. It puts a strain on resources. Instead of high tide raising all ships, it just drains the ocean and sinks all the ships to the bottom. Something the great Milton Friedman said. You can't have open borders and a welfare state. You just can't do it. It's unsustainable. And you're not going to be able to change the immigration laws and the laws of welfare and all this stuff with this Congress, this dysfunctional, disgraceful Congress that we have. That are completely detached from regular America. They're guarded by armed security guards. They're, they're gated in. They're, there's metal detectors at the doors. They're chauffeured wherever they go. They're so detached from America. Maybe not the House as much as the Senate. But still. 
So Chicago officials on Sunday began evicting some migrants from shelters, joining other cities that have made similar moves to ease pressure on overstretched resources. The process is starting gradually out of the nearly 11,000 migrants living in 23 homeless shelters in Chicago, according to the Office of Emergency Management and Communications, a fraction, 34 single adults, were required to leave on Sunday. Many people will be eligible for exemptions. They will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, city officials said. For pregnant women, people with certain medical issues, and migrants who are already in the process of securing housing, families with children can receive renewable 30-day extensions. How were how are illegal migrants getting housing is what I want to know. Like, what? Like, don't you need an ID to get a house? Don't you need an ID to get an apartment? Don't you need, like, don't you have to be a legal citizen to, like, get stuff in this country? This is what worries me, and it worries you. I know. I hear it. I hear it from you guys all the time. The elections. Are these people going to be voting in our elections? Most definitely, they are. And this is one of the many reasons I think they are opening the southern border is it's not just the elections per se. I mean, even if they even if none of them voted in this election, they're still adding seats to the congressional districts, which means because they have to be counted on the census. Remember, that was a big battle Donald Trump tried fighting. He didn't want illegal immigrants being included onto the census. And the census is used to draw up district lines, to draw up district lines and to add seats to the House of Representatives. So therefore, the more people, the more of these illegal immigrants that are going into these cities, the more people they represent because they must be counted on the census. And so therefore, what does it do? It adds seats to the House. And so, you know, this is the plan now. This is the plan that's unfolding in front of our eyes. We're starting to see their plan unfold right in front of us, is that they're adding seats in these blue states, making these blue states bluer. And not only that, but you got Texas that's on its way to turning purple now. You have these red states being flooded. When you allow 10 million illegal immigrants into the country, I mean, folks, you're talking about a whole state's worth of people, and they're going all over. This is a strategy. OK, this is the great replacement theory, and I don't care who calls me a conspiracy theorist. I don't care because that's exactly what they're doing, and they're doing it blatantly right in front of us. They're even telling us. Oh, well, the American worker, the American people don't want to do these jobs that the illegal immigrants will do. Uh, hello. So wouldn't you call that replacing them? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. It's like and, and they. The mental gymnastics you have to do to be a leftist and to accept these awful policies and these destructive ideas is mind-blowing. I mean, you have to literally almost lie to yourself in order to justify this, what's happening right now. And so you read into these articles, like from the New York Times, when they're talking about nearly 11,000 migrants living in 23 homeless shelters. So what happened to the homeless people that were already there? Are you telling me that these homeless shelters were empty? So you mean homeless Americans are being kicked out on the street and being, what, replaced with illegal immigrants in these homeless shelters? <laughs> but officials said that more than 2,000 people would be evicted by the end of April, and many families with children may be forced to exit the shelter network altogether by the summer. Backed by an army of volunteers, Chicago and other cities have found shelter for migrants enrolled in the enrolled their children in schools, provided food assistance, and helped workshops to help them fill out paperwork to apply for work permits. <laughs> My God, folks. So ultimately, who's suffering? So all these kids now have to go into the schools? How is this possible? How are these schools going to be able to take on all these extra kids that don't speak English? I mean, this is, th this is why we always say it all the time why the Democrats are so destructive to this country. Their ideas, their policies, as a, their philosophies as a whole are so destructive and they don't make sense. So you're going to take away from American citizens' education so that illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants and their children can come here. And so now it overworks the teachers, overstretches the schools. And so guess what? Everybody's education 
diminishes. So I say it's it's not all it's not high tides raises all ships. It's drain the water and let all the ships sink to the bottom. Everything is subpar. Everything degrades now. This is why people said this was a bad idea the moment Joe Biden started doing it. And then they started calling us conspiracy theorists. We're gaslighting. We were lying. It's just a Republican GOP talking point. All this stuff. We're like, no, they're opening the southern border and flooding this country with millions of illegal immigrants. And now these blue cities are panicking and they don't know what to do with these millions of illegal immigrants. These sanctuary cities. So when these sanctuary cities actually started to become sanctuaries, they don't want anything to do with it and they can't handle it. It says, but housing migrants has been draining city coffers. Chicago has received more than 37,000 migrants since August 2022. Overall, in the past year, hundreds of thousands of migrants have ended up in large cities. The evictions are placing even more pressure on the volunteers as they scramble to fill the void. Many of them said they have grave concerns about the impact, particularly when they begin to apply to apply to families. There is a lot of fear there will be people in the streets, said Annie Goldberg whose volunteer group, People's Shelter Response, has been assisting migrant families in Chicago. For families in the shelters, there was confusion and worry as news spread of the policy. A Venezuelan migrant named Nellie, who declined to share her last name for the fear of retribution, said that her family's allotted time in the shelter would expire on March 19th. Quote, the social worker said that there was no extension order and that they were waiting for the actual day to arrive to find out what happened, she said. So there you go. So now these sanctuary cities are having to figure out what to do with all these illegal migrants. And that was only 37,000. Folks, we have millions upon millions of illegal immigrants coming into this country. Whole state's worth. It's going to be like at 14, 15 million by the end of Biden's term. It's unsustainable. They're all going to have to get deported. This is why Donald Trump and Stephen Miller have been coming out, saying they're going to have to start the largest deportation campaign in modern history. And Stephen Miller actually came out more recently and gave an idea on how you would do something like that. You're going to have to do it with the local police, that the local police are the only ones that are going to be able to have contact with all these illegal immigrants. Not only that, but all these people that had filed papers to get these shelters, to get these homes, to get all the stuff that they've got. They've all had to sign their name. They've all had to, they've all had to put an address down or something. So it should be easier to find these people. And that's exactly what needs to happen. They can't stay here. And it's going to be hard on the American people. It's going to be a huge political task. But Donald Trump doesn't have anything to worry about. He's done after this term. And so if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis wouldn't be able to do this this term. He'd be too worried about getting reelected. The, these people are going to have to be deported, period. It's unsustainable. They're going to have to be deported and then come in the legal way. And I get the migrant that I get that the immigration policies have to change. I get it. It is entirely way too hard for people to get citizenship for this country. I know a few people that went through the process and it's it's long, it's expensive, it's hard to do. But that's that's kind of part of the deal. That's what makes it so great. I have one of I have a buddy of mine, his name is Sergio. He comes from he comes from Serbia, and he says the day he became an American citizen was the happiest day of his life. He came here with literally nothing. He, he got it. He left everything behind, and he's so happy as an American citizen, so proud. And even he sees what is happening here, and it hurts his heart, man. It breaks his heart that he sees this country going down the road that it's going down. And then you see all these people from like Cuba. You see all these people from third world countries. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, we just left this stuff, man. And you, and you got this place looking exactly like the place we just left. You see it all the time. You see these people from Cuba speaking out. Like this place is turning into a banana republic. To what, what, what they're doing to Donald Trump. What they're doing to, to their political opponents. What they're doing with the spending. The spending is what it is. And they're getting ready to spend even more money. <laughs> which is going to cause even more inflation. These people, I think they're, it's just all broken, folks. That's what it is. The whole system is just broken. The two-party system, the election process is broken. Our immigration process is broken. Our justice system is broken. 
And I hate to say it, but Republicans are part of that destruction too. They're the ones that keep signing for it. These people are getting ready to pass another spending bill that doesn't cut spending, but adds spending. So what makes them any different than Democrats? People should be just as upset with Republicans as they are with Democrats because they keep funding it. They have the power of the purse. They have all the negotiating leverage. You guys remember Donald Trump? He wouldn't take this crap. He wouldn't take this crap. Actually, and I have, and that's, and that is a perfect segue into this final video I told you I was going to play. This old video where Donald Trump was negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer in the White House about shutting down the government if he didn't get a southern border. Here, check this out. He did win North Dakota. This, North Dakota. this is the most unfortunate thing. We came in here in good faith. Uh, and, and Sure you did. Entering into a, a this kind of a, a discussion in the public view. But it's not bad, let, let us no, uh, no, it's but called it, transparency. I, I, I know it's not transparency when we're. <laughs> it's called transparency. Well, I don't know if Donald Trump knew this, and I'm sure he did. But these people hate transparency. This is why they hated Donald Trump, is because he made these people negotiate on camera inside the White House for everybody to see. Normally, these these awful, fake, phony scumbags, these politicians would negotiate these type of deals behind closed doors for the people so the people couldn't see. And this is why they hate Donald Trump so much, because he exposed their corruption. That's why. Not stipulating to a set of facts. And when we wanted to have a debate with you about saying we confront some of those facts without you know saying what? to the we public, need border security. this is what we're going to be talking about, border security. If we don't have border security, we'll shut down the government. This country needs border security. God, man, this guy was great. This man was the people's champion. And that's exactly what I titled this video. This guy was our champion. He was our fighter in the swamp. He said it. You, you hear it? Will in the sh I will shut down the government if I do not get border security. <sighs> We've never seen anything like this. Not in my lifetime anyways. This is what made him so great, man. The wall is a part of border security. Let's have a talk. We're going to get the wall built, and we've done a lot of wall already. It's a big section. It's a big Chuck Schumer looks like an evil villain just sitting there smiling. This guy is awful, man. I can't. So awful. Nancy's awful. Both of these people need to get the hell out of politics, get the hell out of Congress, and just go freaking retire somewhere. My God. Like, what, what would possess these people to stay in politics other than just being corrupt, just fake, phony, just scumbags, just corrupt, crusty, old geezers that want to cling on to power? It doesn't make sense. Part. Is it everything that you need? It's a big part of it. We need to have effective border security. We need a wall in certain parts. No, not in all parts, but in certain parts of a 2,000 mile border. We need a wall. How much money? Uh, How much money, they said. How much money? <sighs> uh, we are doing it much under budget. We're actually way under budget on the areas that we've renovated and areas that we've built. Uh, I would say if we got. If we got $5 billion, we could do a tremendous chunk of wall. $5 billion, folks. You guys remember this conversation, right? They said, oh, my God, their, hair, their heads exploded when he said we need $5 billion. And I think it was $40 billion total. But he needed $5 billion to just finish the important sections of the wall that the Border Patrol requested because that's what would help out the most. The whole thing that walls don't work, what a stupid, stupid talking point. Almost as dumb as defund the police, but I digress. But $5 billion, folks. This was an article from the National Review. Border crisis costs American taxpayers $451 billion annually. House GOP report claims. Imagine that, folks. The guy was asking for $5 billion to secure important sections of our southern border. $5 billion. And now because, because Joe Biden stopped construction on the border wall his first week in office, now the American taxpayer is paying $451 billion a year. Hmm, which one would you rather pay? I don't know. It's kind of difficult. $5 billion? 
mm, to get a border wall or no border wall and pay $451 billion? I don't know. That's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. This is why all this stuff is purposeful. These people don't care about $5 billion. These people, $5 billion is nothing. Joe Biden just released a spending package of $7 trillion. I don't know how many zeros that is, but it's a lot. I mean, we're talking about numbers so big, we don't even, we, our brains can't even comprehend the size of, like the, the size and scope of $7 trillion. Like it would fill up NFL football stadiums with cash. That is in insane amount of money. Fill up a football stadium with cash? That's your spending package? And we're supposed to just go along with this? And Donald Trump wanted $5 billion to build a wall at the southern border? And I'm telling you right now, if they were to allow him to build that wall at the southern border, this border crisis would not be happening. So that must mean that they wanted this to happen. They did not want a border wall because they wanted to open the southern borders when Democrats got power. I mean, it, it, that's it. This is their game plan. It is. And, and I'm so like I said, I'm so tired of being called conspiracy theorists when like every time these conspiracy theories just turn into conspiracies six months down the road like this is happening. The great replacement theory We're the American people are being replaced now with new voters, new constituents. People that won't complain, people that don't know our history, people that don't the people that don't want to assimilate. Anyways, we'll go back into this, back into the, uh, back into the video here. This is a. I think half the world. This isn't a question. This is a national emergency. Drugs are pouring into our country. A flood of drugs coming into this country at the U.S.-Mexico border. Record amounts of opioids, and along with them deadly consequences. People with tremendous medical difficulty and medical problems are pouring in and in many. Yeah. Medical problems. So here is a article from CBS in Chicago. Two days ago. Chicago steps up vaccinations amid measles outbreak tied to migrant shelter. Hmm. So Chicago is ramping up vaccination efforts amid growing concerns over measles as the number of confirmed cases continues to rise. Oh, I wonder if Democrats actually thought about that. What do you think? Ink. No, they don't think about this stuff. They never ask the question, and then what? Everything is done purely on emotions, as far as their constituents are concerned. But the politicians, the, Demo the Democrat politicians, the uniparty politicians, they know exactly what they're doing. You know, Republicans support open borders too, because that's cheap labor. It drives the wages down. And this is exactly what's happening. Once again, Donald Trump was right and these people were wrong. He wanted $5 billion to secure a southern border. And what did they do? They impeached him. They stabbed him in the back. And then the moment Joe Biden got in the office, he canceled construction of the border wall. Mind you, border wall that was already paid for. The money was already allocated. And so the panels of southern border wall we're rusting away in the desert. It only means, it can only mean one thing, folks, is that they want this open border. That is it. This isn't an accident. And they think we're stupid and we can't, we can't see this stuff. And this is exactly why Joe Biden's poll numbers are a disaster. His approval rating is the lowest on record. And he can't figure out why. And he's getting pissed off at all the staffers. <sighs> In many cases, it's contagious. They're pouring into our country. We have to have border security. We have to have a wall as part of border security. And I don't think we really disagree so much Mr. here. Mr. President, please don't characterize the strength that I bring to this. Mr. Meeting. President. Leader of the House Democrats who just won a big victory. Elections but let me, let, me just, let me just say, that's right. and let me that's just why the say this. Doing so well. well, the president <laughs> is representing in terms of his cards over there are not factual. So once again, Nancy Pelosi is trying to play the usual leftist talking point is, oh, Republicans and people on the right, they don't speak the truth. They don't speak in facts. It's just made up stuff. Believe in the science. Believe in evidence. Well, how about this? As a Border Patrol agent, I can tell you walls do work. In 1996, 
and again in 2006, bipartisan legislation authorized the U.S. government to build border barriers. And once built, the barriers made a world of difference. By 2010, apprehensions in San Diego have fallen from half a million to just 68,000, an 87% reduction. And that was a instructional video clip from the Department of Homeland Security that was a border agent going through a long, a long video series of why walls work. So here it, we so here it is. We're the ones dealing in factual evidence based information. And Democrats are running purely on emotions. Walls don't work. Walls don't work. <laughs> As Nancy Pelosi has a wall around their house. Joe Biden just constructed a wall around his house in Rehoboth Beach. Like all these politicians have walls around their homes. But yet the American people can't get a wall on their southern border. And we must be flooded with millions of millions of illegal immigrants. They're going into the schools, taking up the resources because they're not doing it legally, folks. This is like I don't have a problem with legal immigrants. I haven't met one person, one on the right that has a problem with people migrating here legally. In fact, they actually praise people, the people I certainly know do. They respect those people for coming here the right way. They admire them, actually, because it was difficult for them to do it. So I've never met anybody that doesn't like or that, that hates legal immigrants. But this is the problem. This is the separation from Democrats and reality. And they're like, they don't ask themselves, no, there is a difference between legal immigration and illegal immigration. They don't see that difference. They don't see the separation. So they just think anybody and everybody who wants to come here can come here. They can vote. They can, they, they can, get, they can get welfare. They can, live with their, they can live where they want. They can eat. You know, it's like they can take what they want, go where they want. It's like, no, man. Like, this is the insanity of the leftist policies. It doesn't work that way. Anyways, let's finish off this audio, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, end the show off here. We kind of went on longer than I thought. Here we go. Back to Donald Trump steamrolling Chuck Schumer. Our country, we take an oath to protect and defend, and we don't want to have These people that are such phonies, man. By anyone. And I we agree are, with and we are No, no, I agree with we that. Are so let us have a conversation where we don't have to contradict in public the statistics that you put forth, but instead can have a conversation about what will really work and what the American people deserve from us at this uncertain time in their lives. Where well, people deserve a wall. We shouldn't shut down the government over a dispute. And yeah. you want to shut it down. I, no, you no, keep no, talking no, no. about the it. The last time, Chuck, you shut it down. No, no, no. And then you opened 20 it up times. very quickly. And 20 I times. don't want to do what you did. 20 but, times Chuck. you have called for, I will shut down the government if I don't get my wool. None of us have you said You want to know something? You've said it. And here we go. Yes. If we don't get what we want, one way or the other, whether it's through you, through a military, through anything you want to call, I will shut down the government. Okay, absolutely. Fair enough. And we I am disagree. proud, and I'll we tell you disagree. what, I am proud to shut down the government for border security, Chuck, because the people of this country don't want criminals and people that have lots of problems and drugs pouring into our country. So I will take the mantle. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not going to blame you for it. The last time you shut it down, it didn't work. I will take the mantle Good. of shutting down. That is and I'm going to shut it down for border security. But we security. believe you shouldn't okay. shut it down. But you, the Thank you very much, everybody. Man, was that refreshing. Was that not refreshing? I mean, for once, the people had a seat at the table. And they had a champion fighting for them in the swamp. It was such a good feeling to see this guy in there fighting on behalf of the American people. Seal up this border or we're shutting it down. We're shut the whole damn thing down if we don't get security at the southern border. We don't see that now. This is why people, they look back at Donald Trump's administration. And I think, honestly, I think people at the time you know, during the campaign of 2020, I think people just took the, I think people just took Donald Trump's administration and his successful policies and how good this country was doing. I think people took it for granted. 
I think it was so good. They just wanted to like use Donald Trump to get us into a good spot and just kind of kick him to the curb like some kind of Greek tragedy. And it, Donald Trump may end up being a Greek tragedy. I don't know. Which is just, you know, Greek tragedy is somebody that, you know, history will show did in an amazing thing and ended up being a true leader, a true historical figure that benefited the people and will be talked about for for centuries. But yet ended up ending in like a, a tragic kind of thing, like, you know, um, it ended up, you know, in, in Donald Trump's case, ended up leaving this earth a very hated person. Like that's a that would be considered, I think, a Greek tragedy. I, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know exactly what the definition is, but that's that's what I think a Greek tragedy would mean. And Donald Trump may be, but I guarantee you they're going to look back on these days and they're going to say, wow, this guy was a grade A leader. They're going to look at videos and negotiations like that, and they're going to say, man, this guy was good. People are going to look up to Donald Trump as what a leader should be. The guy's just a natural born leader. I don't know what else to say, and I, and I don't think the left can accept that. I don't think they've ever accepted Donald Trump as a legitimate president because they just hate him so bad. Like they, they're jealous. They envy him. They're like they're jealous of him. They, and so they, they, did, they never accepted him as a legitimate president. And so therefore, he is the exception to everything. He could be indicted. You know, he's a president that can be indicted. He could be charged. He can go to prison. He should be investigated. He should be impeached because he's he because he wasn't a legit president. So who are the threats to democracy? These people are. These people never accepted the election. And so I think, you know, to go back to my initial point, I think people just took the very prosperous and peaceful times this country had during 2016 to 2019 you know, because of the China virus, COVID, I think people took those years for granted. I didn't. I knew. <laughs> I knew in, in October of 2020, I bought my first home because I knew that two things, COVID was going to completely destroy the housing market, right? And number two, if Joe Biden happened to win, then this place would be a grade A third world crap hole. And we all knew. And I know you did, too. We all knew that Democrats were up to something and that they were going to cheat. We knew that. I mean, I knew they were going to cheat. I didn't think they were going to do what they did. I didn't know how they were going to, but I knew they were going to do something. I knew they were Mark Elias, Perkins Coy. I knew they were working on something. We've seen all these law changes weeks and months heading into the election changing because of COVID. So essentially, they used COVID to change these laws. You know, on the basis of people can't go out to vote. And so all these mail in ballots have to be shipped out to everybody across the country. So while simultaneously mailing out ballots all over the place in everybody's mailbox, they lowered the threshold of signature verification in some of these states so that these ballots, these mail in ballots, the signatures would be accepted more often than not. And we're talking, it was, they lowered the threshold a lot. The rejection rate of the 2020 election was like 0.08%, where normally it's like 5%. So they lowered the threshold of rejection rates. I mean, so you could have had people just squiggling their name on a ballot and just shipping it in and just mailing it in or putting it in a drop box. This is what happened. And the Trump administration, the Trump campaign was not ready for this. The RNC was a, a freaking disaster, nowhere to be found. And that's why... Ronna McDaniel's gone, and it's now being overtaken by Laura Trump, which my wife just told me today. It's Laura, not Laura Trump. So she's the co-chair of the RNC, already coming out swinging, bringing in lawsuits in the Michigan, bringing in lawsuits in all these key swing states to make sure they don't do it again. The American people have a right to free and fair elections, transparent elections. People have a right to know that their vote counts when they go and vote. Somebody's illegal vote should not cancel out somebody's legal vote, and it should be easier to vote and harder to cheat. I mean, don't these people like Democrats, don't people on the left ever ask themselves, man, why do Democrats not want voter ID? Why do Democrats want drop boxes? Why do Democrats want younger and younger voting ages? Why do Democrats want all these, you know, restrictions and guardrails that were set up to secure elections? Why don't they want them? 
Like, do they ever ask themselves that question? It makes perfect sense to me. It's because they want it easier to cheat. They want shenanigans in elections because there's always been shenanigans in our elections. But the difference between then and now is that elections are going to be so close now. I mean, you're talking about this election is going to come down to a few thousand votes in a few in, a, in three or four different swing states. It's going to be neck and neck. And when you're neck and neck in an, an election. Every single vote needs to be legal and needs to count. Every single one. The transparency and legitimacy and most of all, the faith people have that that election was conducted faithfully. That is the most important part. So after the election, when so-and-so wins or so-and-so wins, and it came down to 5,000 votes in Michigan, people need to be able to go to bed that night or wake up that morning and say, okay, that's, that's the answer then. But people can't do that now because there's so much, all the guardrails have been taken away. We don't have election day anymore. We got election month. You have early voting, late voting, late counting, ballot counters, shutting down at night, pipes bursting, pizza boxes being stuffed in windows. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, what is it? Semi trucks full of ballots just showing up at, at ballot counters, like missing whole trucks full of ballots going missing. Affidavits. There was thousands of affidavits signed in these lawsuits that Giuliani took in these courts in Pennsylvania. With poll watchers actually saying they witnessed fraud. And then people can say, yeah, but there were 61, there were 61 cases brought and Donald Trump lost all of them. Yeah, which case actually went through on merits? Anyone? One? Two? No. None. How about that one? Not one single piece of evidence was allowed to be presented in front of a jury or in front of a judge in all those cases. And see, the left doesn't know this stuff because the media lies to them and they continue to watch it because it makes them feel good. And so, look, we can go on and on. I certainly did. I can go on for hours about this whole disaster we're walking into in this election. But to go back to my original point, unless Joe Biden does a complete 180 with his policies, which he's not going to, then he's, his approval numbers are not going to get better. And so therefore, his anxiety, his frustration with his staffers is only going to get worse. And so I wouldn't count out somebody else not jumping in and replacing Joe Biden. I know a lot of people are saying Joe Biden's it. He got the nomination. He's, he's in it to lose it. But I, I, just, I just don't see how this guy goes into this election with these numbers and Democrats not removing him and replacing him with somebody else like Michelle Obama or somebody. I just don't see it. And so don't, don't count out Michelle Obama, guys. I, I don't know if it's for sure, but just don't because right, these people are really good at manipulating the public. They're really good at lying. They're really good at tricking and manipulating people. So just be on your toes. Stay alert, keep your head on a swivel, and most of all, just go out and vote and bring five, ten people with you. I, I talk about it all the time I, I, with people at work. You know, you got to go out and vote. You got to go out and vote. Like, so anytime someone comes up to me, you know, somebody that like an independent that's not really into voting, all I can tell them is go vote. That's it. If you want to complain about the economy, you know who's in charge. If you want to complain about the southern border, you know who's in charge. So come election time, go vote. That is it. It is the only way things are going to change. And I'm telling you, we are going to have record-breaking votes this year. It is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. And then you have all these persecutions against Donald Trump, which is something I wanted to get into um, with Fannie Willis being able to stay on this case. Uh, I got some audio from Jonathan Turley, who's like, there's no way that this Fannie Willis is going to be able to go through with this case with this type of stuff hanging over her shoulder. She's still being investigated by the Georgia Senate. She's being investigated by the Ethics Committee. She has all these people investigating her. And so she's going to be going through all these investigations and these committees while trying to prosecute a former president and a current frontrunner for the GOP, Joe Biden's political rival. <laughs> no, there's no way. So I got some audio from Jonathan Turley, and that's something I wanted to get into. I've been kind of obsessed with the whole Fannie Willis thing because. The corruption was just so mind-blowingly shocking to me that these people can just be this brazenly corrupt. And the judge did not do what he's supposed to do. The law was clear. He should have disqualified both 
Nathan Wade and Fannie Willis, but he didn't because he's up for a re-election coming up. And this is what happens. This is what worries me about these judges. This is why this is what happens when you have a politicized justice system. You have judges and prosecutors worried about elections. And you have judges that make wrong decisions because they fear the mob, the mobocracy, the Democrats. And so, listen, a lot of all this stuff is going to come to the Supreme Court, which was something else I wanted to get into. But we'll get into all this on the next episode. As always, thank you guys for tuning in. I want you guys to have a good Monday, and I hope your week goes well. I will talk to you guys here in a little bit. God bless you, and God bless America. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye.